Boldwood presents The Making of Us, written by Debbie Howells, and read by Will Close and Claire Storey. The moral right of the author has been asserted. This performance is owned by Boldwood. Prologue. Stevie. It wasn't so long ago that I had no idea that the worst possible thing to have happened in my life was a precursor to what was probably the best. But unless you've discovered the art of hopping between far-off parallel universes, the existence of time means there's an order in which events have to unfold. Even so, there was an otherworldly familiarity to what I was feeling as I sat in the departure lounge at London Gatwick that March day. It was the first time I'd flown from here, yet it felt as if at some point in time I'd been here before. As it happened, I didn't pay it the attention it merited. Instead, my mind was filled with thoughts of everything I'd recently lost. But in a world defined by grief, I was yet to become that person who was open to the magic the universe holds, who could see beyond the trifling matters that govern the structure of our days. All I knew was that something was missing. Simply going about my days, putting one foot in front of the other, I didn't, in all honesty, expect anything to change. That day at the airport, I was just a girl, staring at the book on my lap, staving off the feeling of fear that was eating relentlessly away at me. Trying not to think about all the people around me, my head was filled with thoughts of the flight that lay ahead. Just a short hop, I kept telling myself. London to Limoges in southwest France wasn't far, not to most people. But Limoges might as well have been on the other side of the world, even though for now my home was there, technically speaking. The home that was still a shell, my heart remaining firmly in denial, nomadically searching as all hearts do, for somewhere in this world where it belongs. Chapter One Stevie Sitting at the boarding gate, I stare with a macabre sense of fascination as another aircraft takes off, my stomach churning with nerves as it lifts into the sky. If anything happens now, if the aircraft malfunctions, if the law of physics were to change suddenly for everyone on board, it'd be too late. Feeling my heart start to race, I twist my fingers together, trying to focus on breathing, my tried and tested method of dealing with irrational fear. It works, sometimes, just not always. Feeling myself calm slightly, as I reach into my bag to take out my drink, out of the corner of my eye I notice this guy walk in. For some reason I can't take my eyes off him. Not because there's anything particularly remarkable about him, there isn't. Carrying a battered retro barrel bag, his jeans look as though he's slept in them, while his hair is dishevelled, as if he couldn't be bothered to comb it this morning. He's wearing dark glasses he clearly thinks are cool, which, in the shade of the departure lounge, are completely unnecessary. Finding an empty chair, he perches on the edge of it and feels in his pocket for something. Producing his phone, he slides his sunglasses on top of his head, and I see the real reason he's wearing them. He's hiding what looks like the mother of all hangovers. Studying the screen, he sits there, smiling to himself, his face lighting up for a moment before, oblivious to everyone else, laughter erupts from him. But as he gets a set of headphones out of his bag and puts them on, the smile is gone as he sits back and closes his eyes. Immersed in whatever he's listening to, one of his feet taps to the rhythm, then his fingers. Then, as I watch, slightly fascinated, he seems entirely lost in his musical world, as his whole body seems to get taken over. Aware I'm staring at him, I turn my attention to my book, but as I open it, my flight is called. This is where I forget about everything else, my mind instantly filling with doomsday scenarios, 
as I think about boarding, fear making my body start to shake. It's a short flight, I remind myself. But distance is irrelevant, my inner voice goads me. Once you're off the ground, anything could happen, as well you know. My sense of impending doom is not helped by the aversion I have to confined spaces, to being crammed in with too many people. It's one short hop between here and Limoges, I remind myself, after I need never do this again. Clasping my hands tightly, I force myself to think about something else. But as I try to get up, it's as though I'm frozen, unable to move when I hear a voice. Excuse me, but are you okay? Startled, I look up to see the guy with the dark glasses standing there. Of course, I say briskly. The fact that I've been noticed by him galvanising me into action. Glancing towards the gate, I watch the last two passengers going through. I was miles away. Standing up, I pick up my bag. He grins at me. Cool. It's just that if you're heading for Limoges, everyone else has boarded. Yes, I take a deep breath. D don't let me hold you up. Nodding, he turns, loping away in the direction of the gate. I wait until his passport has been checked and he disappears onto the air bridge. And that should most definitely have been the end of that. I mean, there are at least 140 seats on this Airbus A320. And when I booked mine, the ones next to me were empty. But, for whatever reason, today the plane is almost full. After boarding, I find the seat next to mine taken by the guy. Staring toward the window, he appears deep in thought. Um, excuse me? My cheeks are suddenly hot. Turning, he looks surprised when he sees me. Oh, it's you. You made it then. Yes, I'm sitting here. I point to the window seat. Oh, of course. He stands up to let me pass. Thank you. I breathe in a faint waft of a woody cologne as I slide past him. After sitting down and taking my book out of my rucksack, I place my bag under the seat in front of me, aware of the guy putting on his headphones again, before he starts quietly humming to himself. Minutes later, the aircraft doors close, and there's a jolt before we push back, then taxi slowly out to the end of the runway. Trying to still my nerves, the humming of the guy next to me starts to grate, Unable to subdue the panic I'm starting to feel, I gaze out of the window. It's a beautiful early spring day, the sky broken only by small, fluffy white clouds. It should be a perfect day for flying, but as the aircraft starts its take-off roll, fear engulfs me. Clenching my hands together, I close my eyes. Planes crash, as I know too well. Maybe I should have listened to my intuition and I shouldn't be on this flight. Then the worst thought of all, as the aircraft lifts off and the ground falls away, if anything happens now, it's too late. Shit, I mutter. Unable to resign myself to my fate, I start to hyperventilate. Are you okay? The guy next to me sounds concerned again. Yes, no. Overwhelmed, I squeeze my eyes more tightly shut, telling myself to breathe, counting each breath, drawing them out until, at last, they slow. When I open my eyes again, the guy is watching me. You want me to call one of the cabin crew? No, I say quickly, then add, I thought I could do this. My voice is shaking. Try not to think about it, he says brightly. Safest way to travel, I always tell myself. I'm Ned, by the way, he holds out a hand. I'm Stevie. As the aircraft lurches, instead of shaking his hand, I grab at it. In spite of myself, I'm unable to ignore the tiny spark between us. It's okay, it's just a little turbulence. Ned looks at me slightly anxiously. The spark is instantly gone. It's all very well him saying that. And I know he's trying to help, but in my mind, little and turbulence don't belong in the same sentence. That's the point. And unless you're a pilot or something, you're guessing. You don't actually know. It's already stopped. Ned's still looking at me. So, where are you headed in France? To a small village in Corrèze, 
I tell him the name. A stone's throw from its border with the better known Dordogne. It's what some people would describe as the middle of nowhere. Nice part of the world. I know it well, though I would have thought it was a bit quiet for a holiday. He looks nonplussed as though he can't see why anyone would want to go there. Not for camping, I used to go there as a child with my parents. I don't tell him that I live there. That, after leaving Matty and clearing out my parents' place, since moving to France, the tiny village house is the only thing I have in the world. That my sole reason for travelling back to the UK was to settle the last of the paperwork to do with my late parents' estate, such as it was. But he doesn't need to know that. In fact, there's little point in pursuing this conversation, and I turn to the window again, struggling to keep my fear under control as I gaze outside at the clouds, then at the shades of blue in the far-reaching sky. My world is small, I muse, listening to the engine's drone, but I still remember when it wasn't, how it was a bright, expansive place of infinite hope, of dreams where anything was possible, where I believed in the magic of beginnings, in love, too. That's how it was until that fateful day, when, out of the blue, my world came crashing down. To be fair, it wasn't the world itself that crashed. It was the small, twin-prop plane in the depths of Africa that stopped defying the laws of gravity for long enough to fall out of the sky taking with it the two people I loved most in the world, my parents. With no one else in my life, I turned to Matty, my boyfriend. But in the midst of my grief, it was about to get worse. In what felt like the cruelest of coincidences, I discovered that he'd been summoning up the courage to tell me it was over between us. He'd met someone else. This coming so soon after losing my parents... I was left rootless, lost, struggling to get up every day. It felt as though I'd lost the foundations of my life. It also made no sense that when my parents had been selfless, dedicating their lives to charitable causes, helping children in war zones, their lives had been brutally cut short while millions of shallow, feckless people, just like Matty, carried on living trampling over other people's hearts, leaving a wake of destruction behind them. It was a chapter of my life that left me traumatised. After weeks of therapy, I worked it out, that I'd morphed into one of those people who have become stuck in life. The shock of losing my parents, leaving me half metamorphosed. There was no going back, yet emotionally I was unequipped to move forward. Life doesn't treat all of us the same, and some of us are destined to be alone, I've realised. But there's a thing about being alone, I'm discovering. It's safer. If there are no people in your life, you can't lose them. Ned's voice stirs me from my thoughts. How are you doing? I turn to look at him. Sorry? It's just that I noticed you haven't been reading. He glances at the unopened book on my lap. Oh, I was thinking, I say defensively. You're into birds, he sounds curious. Birds? I glance at the book on my lap entitled Bird Watching. It isn't so much about watching birds, I tell him. It's more about seeing life from different points of view. For example, traditional, indigenous, and from a bird's, of course. The bit I'm reading at the moment is about Buddhism. He looks surprised. Sounds interesting. Suddenly I'm curious about him. What brings you to France? Family, he glances away. My parents live there, by chance not far from your village. I stare at him as he says parents, plural. Does he have any idea how lucky that makes him? That's nice, I say too quickly. Where do you live? In England, I mean. London, he says. It's where I ought to be now, but duty summons. Oh? He smiles. It's my mother's birthday. And seeing as we don't get together very often, my father's organised a party. It's a flying visit. No pun intended. 
For a moment he looks impressed with his wit. I fly back to London on Friday. Suddenly I have all these things I want to say to him. About making the most of his time with them. How you never know when your family are going to be ripped from your life, never to be seen again. How suddenly everything can change. But instead I try to smile. I hope she has a nice birthday. Engrossed in my book, the rest of the flight passes uneventfully, and it isn't long before the aircraft starts its descent. As the engines throttle back, my catastrophizing mind runs away with me again. But my worst fears are unrealized, and twenty minutes later we're on the ground. As we taxi in, Ned glances at my book again. Closing it, I hold it out to him. Why don't you take this? He looks taken aback. I can't do that. I've read it five times already, I tell him. Call it a thank you for being so nice to me, about my ludicrous and unfounded fear. I mean, here we are, and in one piece. It isn't ludicrous. His eyes are warm. Honestly, I'm still holding the book out. You're doing me a favour. It will encourage me to read something else. He looks amused. OK, in that case I will. Thank you. His eyes are dancing. You must be relieved the flight is over. I nod. I am. More than he'll ever know. Have a nice stay with your family. Thanks. But I can't help noticing he looks distracted. Chapter 2 Ned As I take the book, I can't help staring at Stevie. Her eyes are beautiful, a brilliant blue that's almost turquoise, setting off perfect skin and long copper hair. Will you be okay now? Something in me wants to spin this out to keep her talking. Now that we're on the ground, I'll be fine. She has a composure about her that wasn't there before. I put her book in my rucksack. I suppose I'd better get moving. Behind me, passengers are chivying to get off. Good luck. I say, immediately feeling stupid. I mean, for fuck's sake, what kind of idiot says that to a total stranger? You too, she says, her eyes briefly meeting mine before darting away. And then I'm swept along towards the aircraft door by the milling passengers behind me, leaving her sitting there. For reasons I can't explain, wishing I weren't. After disembarking, I catch a fleeting glimpse of her as I make my way through passport control, then again while I wait in baggage reclaim. Alone, she looks slightly lost, turning away to haul my case off the carousel. When I look around, she's gone. I walk through the automatic doors into the arrivals hall, a smile stretching across my face when I see Nina, my sister, waiting for me. Hey, I walk up to her and kiss her on the cheek. Thanks for coming to get me. Someone had to. She's cool, Nina, with brown eyes and toffee-coloured hair streaked with blonde. She smooths an errant strand of it behind one of her ears. Did you bring me some ciggies? I forgot, sorry. It's only half a truth. The other half is about my refusal to be complicit in her poisoning herself. You're a terrible liar. Nina sounds pissed off. You know I'll buy them anyway. They're almost as cheap in the shops here, I remind her. And at least it won't be on my conscience when you're dying from lung cancer, I warn her. Shut the fuck up, she says amiably. Anyway, a few cigarettes aren't going to kill me. Pausing, her voice is different as she goes on. So, what have you been up to, little brother? The usual. I shrug. Work, play, sleep. Though, probably not enough of the latter. Or the former, come to that. How's Jessie? Shame she couldn't join you. Jessie's great, I say brightly, leaving out what Jessie said about how deadly boring rural France was. She's just been promoted. Jessie's my girlfriend of the last three years. While my career seems doomed not to get off the ground... Her star is rising. Again? Nina sounds surprised. 
How does that work with you guys? It's okay. I'm evasive. Relationships are about balance. It can swing either way. Though ours has become somewhat weighted in one direction. And though I've been denying it to myself, Jesse and I are not what we used to be. But Nina knows me too well. She's cool with that? The struggling musician and the high-flying consultant? She says more quietly. I'm silent for a moment. It's not just the lack of balance that's a problem. It's the growing absence of passion between us. We've been together three years. Things change, don't they? Believe it or not, I think I'm finally settling down into adult life. I tried to joke. But I'm thinking of the party Jesse went to without me, which turned out to be more of a grown-up kind of dinner party. How she said it had been nice not getting completely pissed, which is totally understandable, except that Jessie is an all-or-nothing kind of girl. Mostly all. Plus, it wasn't just the one party. Nina's silent for a moment. Don't sell yourself short, will you, Ned? Uncomfortable, I change the subject. So, um, about Mama's party, I say casually. What's the plan? The usual, she says coolly. A hundred guests, outside caterers, a truckload of Philippe's vintage wine. Great, I say, my lack of enthusiasm tempered by the single fact that our neighbour is a superlative winemaker. Beside me, Nina snorts. Sorry, not fool, little brother. I did suggest that you should play some of your music. Before I can stop it, a ridiculous sense of hope rises in me. What did they say? But I should know better. My parents' opinion of my music career is common knowledge and expressed far too frequently. They'd already booked some freaking harpist, Chantel something or other. I haven't a clue what she's like. Sorry, Ned. Nina sounds regretful. I tried. Her voice changes. I'm really glad you're here. Me too. But even to me, my words are unconvincing. Comforting myself that I only have to be here a few days, days that no doubt will be eased by Philippe's wine, I lapse into silence. I rarely come back to France. My father has never accepted my music as a career, and too many conversations have turned into heated confrontations about when I'm going to get a proper job, how music will never make me any money. It has added to the growing rift between us, which is why when he called a few weeks back, I put him off. I'll call you back, Dad. I'm in the middle of something. The something was actually a boozy pub lunch with my band. Ned, this won't take long. He sounded irritated. It's your mother's birthday. She'd very much like it if you could be there. I'd resign myself to being summoned back to the fold, but the familiar sense of not belonging is back. Put simply, my life has moved on. While as Nina turns into the driveway, on the surface, everything here is just the same. The big old French manor house, surrounded by neatly clipped shrubs, the lawns mown in stripes, the gravel drive immaculate. Nina parks around the side, next to my father's Mercedes. After sitting there for a moment, I get out. After the constant noise of London, there's a silence I can only describe as deafening. Until I walk towards the door, and the dogs come tearing out to greet me, falling over themselves in their race to be first. Hey, boys. Crouching down, I hold out my arms. Excitedly woofing and trying to lick me at the same time, no wonder they're happy. They've mastered what humans lose sight of. Yesterday forgotten, tomorrow unknown. All they know is this moment. Maybe we should all be more dog, I'm musing, as my father comes to meet me. Good of you to come, Ned. His face is stern, his hand gripping my shoulder. Your mother will be pleased to see you.
The gripping hand that's the closest we ever come to a hug feels less than welcoming. It's as though I've become the family black sheep, I can't help thinking. Feeling oddly displaced as I walk along the familiar passageway that leads towards the kitchen. My mother's voice drifting towards me, clearly beseeching one of her many friends. You must come, Cherie. Please, I am counting on you. You know it won't be the same without you. As I go into the kitchen, she turns. Seeing me, her eyes light up. I must go. Abiento. Blowing a kiss down the phone, she puts it down and holds out her arms. Ned. I walk into them. As they go around me, I hug her back, slightly awkwardly. As always, she's stylishly dressed, her makeup perfect, but she seems smaller, I can't help noticing, and a little older. The strands of grey in her long hair expertly blended with blonde. But a year has passed since I was last here. We are all getting older. Happy birthday, Mama. I kiss her soundly on the cheek. Thank you. Oh, Ned, it is so good to see you. She holds my face in her hands, her eyes warm as she gazes into mine. How is your life in London? How is Jessie? It's good. Everything's good. Gently pulling free, I pin on a smile. I have a gig coming up, it's... Uh, why I can only stay a couple of days. Naughty boy, she frowns at me. You are away for a year and you have only two days to spend with your mother. Suddenly I feel guilty. I'll come back again soon, I promise. I'm saved as Nina comes in. Mama, the florist has just arrived with a whole ton of flowers. She wants to know where you want them all. I am sure I told her this afternoon. Looking mildly irritated, my mother sweeps out of the kitchen in a waft of Chanel's cocoa while Nina makes us coffee. Passing me a cup, her eyes pause on me. I know that look. I'm taken aback. What look? Guilt. She shrugs. Pointless emotion, Ned. You haven't done anything wrong, remember? But hey... I'm forgetting, you don't do emotions. I do guilt, I say wryly. And to be honest, she has a point. It's been a year. She could go and see you in London, Nina points out. I know, but it wouldn't be a good idea. And it isn't just the thought of our mother being shoehorned into my and Jessie's tiny flat. It's the prospect of my life under her close scrutiny. Asking uncomfortable questions, I'd rather dodge. But that aside, time seems to be passing at never-increasing speed, only adding to my guilt. Not wanting to dwell on what I haven't achieved with it, I drink my coffee. Then as Nina goes off to make a video call for work, for no reason, I'm thinking of Stevie, the girl on the plane whether it was one of those chance meetings that will fade into the past, forgotten by both of us, or whether fate will conspire and our paths will cross again. Early that evening, I call Jessie. Hey, I miss you. It's something I say less and less, that, if I'm honest, I feel less and less. But lounging on my bed hundreds of miles away. I feel very alone. It's a sentiment she clearly doesn't share. I can't talk for long, Ned, and I'm about to go out. It's obvious from her voice she's in a hurry. Oh. This isn't at all what I'd hoped for from her. Anywhere nice? She hesitates. Er, uh, just to a bar. Nice, who with? I try to sound interested. Some friends, she says vaguely. When are you back? In a couple of days. For the gig on Saturday. Right. She pauses. 
Look, can we catch up properly then? I'm, I'm sorry, but I really have to go. She ends the call, leaving me lying there in silence, somewhat bemused, contemplating that there was no love in her voice, no affection. She didn't even ask how I was, or my parents. But what's stranger still is that I feel nothing. But it probably isn't strange at all. As Nina said, I have an inexplicable talent for being unemotional. And that evening, with my mother's pre-birthday celebrations about to kick off, it isn't the time to be preoccupied. Going downstairs, I take a deep breath and pour myself a large glass of wine. At a dinner table set for twenty, the food is sublime. The wine freely flowing, the company surprisingly entertaining, and very soon, the last person I'm thinking about is Jesse. You must play at my daughter's 21st, Ned. Genevieve, one of my mother's oldest friends, corners me after we've eaten. The girls? She raises perfectly arched eyebrows. They will love you. Thank you. Gazing at her with the gratitude that follows consuming four glasses of my father's finest Bordeaux, Philippe's wine being reserved for tomorrow, I forget my promise to myself. Only make decisions when you're sober. Thank you very much. I would I would love to. I'll give you one of my cards. I feel in my pocket for a business card, frowning, reaching deeper, before remembering, sorry, in my jacket pocket. <laughs> Upstairs. Ned. Genevieve brushes an imaginary fleck of dust off my shirt before her hand gently pats my cheek. Do not worry about a card. I will speak with your mother. Not sure if she's being flirtatious, I reach for another glass of wine from a passing waiter just as Nina comes over. Been propositioned, little brother. She raises an eyebrow at me. To be honest, I'm not sure. I gaze after Genevieve's retreating back. I suppose in one sense, yes, I have. She wants me to play at her daughter's 21st birthday party. You're brave. Nina sips her wine. Have you met Persephone? Persephone? I splutter on my wine. Is that her name? It is... Nina lights up a cigarette. She and her friends got arrested in Paris not so long ago for taking something illicit to a party. What's wrong with that? I look at her, mystified. I mean, doesn't everyone? I think it was something to do with the party being thrown by the French foreign minister's son at his official residence. She exhales a small cloud of smoke. Apparently it was quite a rowdy party. The neighbours ended up calling the police. Of course, it didn't help that his father was out of the country, visiting Ukraine, I believe. Persephone was found guilty of possession, blah, 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 blah. It was all hushed up, of course. Money buys everything, doesn't it? Shit. I'm starting to regret saying I'd do the party. You'll have to come with me, as backup. She shakes her head, disbelievingly. You have to be kidding, Ned. I awake on the morning of my mother's 57th birthday to the sound of birdsong outside my bedroom window, my eyes turning to Stevie's book on my bedside table. Sitting up, I wince, my head thumping as a few blurred memories of last night come back. I get up, go downstairs, and put the kettle on, before letting the dogs out. Standing on the doorstep, I take in the grass sparkling in the sunlight, the first of the cherry blossoms starting to flower, the delicate warmth of the sun, all of them signs that spring is coming. Ned, darling. My mother bustles into the kitchen in a pink silk kimono over her pyjamas. She comes over and plants a kiss on one of my cheeks. Last night was fun, was it not? It was a great night, Mama. I watch her pour herself a strong coffee, 
Did you enjoy yourself? Last night was your father's idea. She's silent for a moment, her eyes resting on mine. Do you know what the best thing is? She sounds uncharacteristically wistful. Maybe it is because I'm getting older, but it is having my children here, together, even if it is only for two days. Sounding more like herself, she says it pointedly. I frown slightly. It's as though there's something she isn't saying. I open my mouth to ask her, but then I put it down to growing older, the way it changes how you think. It's good to be here. I hold her gaze, for the first time meaning every word. Just then my father walks in. Ah, Ned, uh, just the person. I need the cars moved. Give me a hand, would you? That was it, I think, when I look back later. That single brief moment, alone with my mother, before everything changed. Potentially the reason I came here. To be with the woman who brought me into the world. Who raised me to become the musician she's less than proud of. To be unashamedly myself. Whatever that is. But none of us are perfect. After going out to help my father, the day passes in a whirl of beautifully dressed guests, more exquisite food, trays of champagne proffered by silent waiters. Philippe's promised vintage wine, one of the high points, the other being my mother's speech. Thank you to all of you for coming to share this day, especially those who have travelled a long way. Her eyes rest on me for a moment. Maybe being older makes me a little wiser. At least I hope so. I think it also gives me the right to be outspoken. As she pauses, there's a ripple of laughter. But what I'd really like to say is what matters most to me is the people in my life. She falters, but only for a moment. It means the world to have you all here. I would just like to say, from the bottom of my heart, thank you. As she finishes speaking, there's a silence before clapping starts. Then my father steps in and kisses her on the cheek. Bon anniversaire. Turning to everyone, he raises his glass. To my beautiful wife, Amy. I watch as all the guests stand to toast my mother. Briefly, I catch her eye again, noticing her face soften as she holds my gaze. What was that about? I say to Nina. Our parents' parties are known for being glam and riotous rather than poignant. My sister looks just as puzzled. I don't know. Frowning, I can't help thinking that, like me, Nina's picked up on something. We find out the following morning that our sibling radar, though woefully out of practice, when put to the test, is still bang on. In the kitchen we're making coffee when our parents join us. Sore heads? My father inquires. Nina shakes hers. Not me, she says firmly. Ned drank my share. Ask him. Rubbish. I muster as much dignity as I can. I'm absolutely fine. When our father falls silent, Nina and I glance at each other as our mother steps forward. Darlings? It isn't just the paleness of her skin, the troubled look in her eyes. It's palpable, the feeling around us, that something is terribly wrong. It's the moment our lives change forever. When the carefreeness of youth, the assumption that life can be taken for granted, come to an end. The knowledge that cancer can happen to anyone is no longer a theory. From this point on, it's an integral part of all our lives. The thing is, there's no such thing as 
just a small tumour, is there? Across the garden, Nina and I sit on the swings under an old beech tree that had been there since our childhood. I can't believe she went ahead with the party. Nina's voice is tight. If it were me, I wouldn't have been able to. Me neither. I'm silent for a moment. I can't believe they didn't tell you. Me neither. Nina's face is ashen. I mean, I live here, for Frick's sake. She's silent. Shows how good they are at hiding things, doesn't it? I swallow the lump in my throat. Don't beat yourself up. I still should have known, Ned. Nina's eyes glitter with tears as she looks at me. We both should have. What happens now? She sounds like a little girl. How do we know if it isn't more than just a little tumour? What else haven't they told us? There's quite a lot, as it turns out, including the fact that it's secondary breast cancer after an initial diagnosis that was picked up years ago. Caught early, she didn't even need chemo, but this time around, as she tells us the prognosis isn't good, the reality sinks in that time is running out. It's as though I'm caught between two worlds when I catch a flight back to London for the gig that weekend. There's guilt I've never known the like of at leaving my parents and Nina. Yet the fact is, life goes on. Or so I keep telling myself as I gaze out of the window at the clouds. But it feels even less real when I get back to the flat. If I've been hoping for any comfort from her, Jesse is oddly subdued. I'm sorry about you, Mom, Ned. She hugs me, but it's the polite kind of hug you'd give a distant friend rather than compassionate. Then she tells me there's a dinner party we're invited to. I sigh. <laughs> I'm really not in the mood, Jess. I was hoping you and I could have a quiet evening in. I didn't expect you to come with me. She doesn't meet my eyes. But Alice organised this weeks ago. I can't cancel now, you know what she's like. I do indeed know what Alice is like. But this is my hour of need. Going over to Jessie, I put my arms around her. These are pretty exceptional circumstances. I'm sure she'd understand if you told her why. But she pulls away gently. I'm sorry, Ned, I, I can't do that. It's obvious that Alice's party is more important to her than my mother's illness. And in the event, Jessie goes out early, her hair freshly washed, wearing a dress I haven't seen before, and spritzed in an unfamiliar perfume. Alone in our flat, I go to the box room. It's more like a large cupboard, and arguably the least tidy part of the flat, but it's where I feel most at home the place where my creative genius gets unleashed. Putting on my headphones, I go through the music for tomorrow night's gig. The gig's a 30th birthday party at a posh hotel. The kind of gig I've been striving for, that if I get right, could lead to many more. It seems the cruelest irony that for reasons I can do nothing about, my mind is elsewhere. Losing track of time, the evening rapidly passes. I'm on my fourth beer and still working when Jessie pushes the door open. She's obviously had a good time. Her face is flushed from wine, her eyes sparkling brightly. You're up late. Just getting ready for tomorrow. I pause. Did you have fun? It was okay. Turning away, she stifles a yawn. Oh, Alice sends love, by the way. She stretches up her arms. I'm going to bed. Her lack of affection leaves me sitting there, slightly stunned. Has she always been this cold? Or is it just that I haven't noticed before? As she closes the door behind her, I can't decide. 
The following morning, I lie in bed, listening to the city coming to life. At some point, Jessie's phone buzzes and she stirs, yawning as she picks it up and glances at the screen. As she's holding it, her phone buzzes again. Reading the message, she types a reply. Everything okay? Lying there, I stare at the ceiling. It's just Alice. Stretching luxuriantly, she yawns again. Oh, I'd better have a shower. Throwing the duvet back and getting out, she pads naked to the bathroom. I take in her tanned legs and soft skin, the tangle of long hair. Wonder again how it is that I feel not even slightly aroused. But I have other things going on, I remind myself. My mother's illness, still forefront of my mind, not to mention this gig tonight. Sighing, I get out of bed, just as Jessie comes out of the bathroom. As we pass, I brush against her damp skin. Yet again, thinking how odd it is that it does nothing to me. If timing lies at the heart of luck and great fortune, of the most brilliant synchronicities, it stands to reason that it's also the orchestrator of our greatest downfalls, never more clearly demonstrated than when I ask Jessie if she's coming to the gig. Despite the distance between us, she's always been my staunchest supporter, so it hasn't crossed my mind that she might not want to. Plus, if it goes well, as I'm hoping it will, this could be the start of redressing the imbalance between us. You're playing at a private party, Ned, she objects. It's not for you to invite people. <laughs> you can be my roadie, I joke. No one will argue with that. I don't suppose anyone will even notice. I pause, frowning at her as I work it out. Back in the day, she wouldn't have given it a second thought. Be honest, Jess. You don't want to, do you? It isn't that. Standing there, Jessie looks awkward. As it sinks in that this is about far more than the gig, the blood in my veins turns to ice. What do you mean? She shakes her head. I wasn't going to say anything. But as she sits on the edge of the bed, her composure vanishes. This is hopeless. What is... I say stupidly. Pretending, Ned. Us. Sounding distraught, Jessie doesn't meet my eyes. I know the timing is terrible, but we don't do anything together anymore. We don't even like the same things. At last, she manages to look at me. Why can't we both be honest with each other and admit we're avoiding the elephant in the room? Elephant. It sinks in that she's talking about the void between us. A void I've noticed myself, but kind of got used to. It even has an odd familiarity to it. But after my mother's bombshell, and the week I've just had, suddenly I can't face it. You're right about one thing. This is terrible timing. I know. But what's the point in going on like this? She says sadly. You and I... It used to be different, Ned. You used to have dreams. I believed in you. I really thought you were going to be one of those musicians who made it. But all this time is going by. Her words sting. It's never too late. And I still have dreams. I say obstinately. She's not putting all of this on me. And don't forget, it's you who's always shoehorning in dinners and parties and galleries and shopping, not to mention evenings at the theatre, and with... It isn't that, Ned. Jessie's face is pale. I freeze. What is it, then? She sighs. Then the words start tumbling out of her. Your music is great. I love it. You know I do. But the fact is, you may never get a break. Not everyone does. 
Meanwhile, you won't even consider doing anything else. Gobsmacked, I shake my head. But you've always supported my music. You're right, I have. She looks away. For quite a long time. No one would be more delighted than me if it took off. Her eyes fill with tears. I suppose it would be nice if things were on more equal terms. If now and then it were you taking me out rather than the other way around. If we could plan an extravagant holiday. Buy a nice car. Getting up, she folds her arms around herself. You don't have to tell me how shallow it sounds. Desperation flickers in her eyes. But it feels like everything's down to me. Like we don't have any balance in our lives. It's the same word Nina used. Balance. This is only for now, I say defiantly. It won't always be like this. You don't know that, she says. I'm silent for a moment. I can't believe we're having this conversation, right now, when my mother is ill. She looks uncomfortable. I didn't plan to, Ned, but when it comes to something like this, there's never a good time. And I can't go on putting my life on hold. Standing there, it's like I've been punched. But Jessie hasn't finished. You're a great guy, but... But what? I prepare myself for the next blow. The butt telling me everything I need to know. Jessie looks exasperated. It's your feelings. Or lack of them, rather. Your emotions, Ned. I, I can't read you. Your mother's ill, for frick's sake, and you're acting like everything's the same. What am I supposed to do? I stare at her. Life goes on, and I have a gig, remember? Has it occurred to you that just maybe I'm trying to hold things together? Is that all you can say? She looks at me incredulously. Wow, Ned. If that's what you think, you really do have problems. She pauses. Do you realise that in the three years we've been together, not once have I seen you cry? Take yesterday, for instance, when you told me about your mother. You were completely unemotional. It might have looked like that, I bluster, but you've no idea how I feel inside. She sighs. Oh, just for once, can't you be honest with yourself? My body tenses. I'm not hiding anything from you. You can't even see it, can you? She looks at me sadly again. You've been doing it so long, you don't know any different. And that's the thing. I'm beginning to realise. I don't even know who the real Ned is. This is the real Ned. I say urgently, standing right here. Then I stop. Are you saying you want us to break up? In the silence, as we stand there, her phone buzzes again. A look of something like guilt crosses her face. As I gaze at her, I realise that just like that, it's over between us. You've made your mind up, haven't you? I didn't plan for it to be now. Jessie's voice is shaking. I wanted to be here for you. You have a friggin' odd way of showing it, I say tightly. Suddenly it's too much. Look, I can't deal with this. Once I've done the gig, I'm going back to France. I want to spend some time with my mother while I still can. I'll take as much of my stuff as I can. I'll arrange for someone to collect the rest. Going to the wardrobe, I get the case down from on top of it and start to pack, before remembering the book Stevie gave me, which I brought with me to carry on reading on the plane. Seeing it on the floor next to the bed, I pick it up. What's that? Jessie eyes it with interest. A friend gave it to me. A friend? She frowns. Is there something you're not telling me, Ned? Absolutely nothing, I say wearily. Is it really so alien to her that I should have a friend? I met a girl on a flight. She lent me her book. She thought I needed a distraction. You mean you actually talked to her? Jessie looks confused. There was nothing. But as her phone buzzes again, suddenly I realise it was something. 
But the real reason for Jessie's interest in the book is to deflect from whatever it is she isn't telling me. Don't try and put this on me, Jessie. We both know it's you who's met someone else. Right on cue, her phone buzzes for the third time. I meet her eyes. That isn't Alice, is it? Somehow I keep myself together for the gig. My performance is less than perfect, but buoyed up with beer, in the circumstances I think I pretty much excel myself, and it helps that almost everyone at the party is pissed. Jessie isn't there when I get back to the flat. Packing the rest of my stuff, all that remains are some books I don't really want anymore, and some musical paraphernalia that will have to be sent on separately. When I've finished, I gaze around the flat, at the calm, neutrally painted walls, the enormous sofa that nearly didn't make it up here, then at the views of the Thames, the lights of aircraft making their descent into Heathrow, wondering how Jesse and I have come to this, how three years of my life can be over, just like that. Leaving my key on the side, I drag my cases downstairs and take an Uber to the airport. When I check in my baggage, the cost is eye-watering. But in the context of everything else that's going on, I just pay it. When I analyse it, all I'm leaving is a flat I don't love and a woman who doesn't love me. A career that isn't going anywhere. But if anyone had told me that endings can be beginnings, I'd probably have punched them. Topping up my caffeine levels sufficiently to keep me awake.